Yes, a couple times every week, John comes in to bring us the latest in the UFO news that's happening around the world. And, and John, I'm pretty excited about this first one because if outside of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the one movie I always tell our listeners to listen to is the 1986 Disney Flight of the Navigator. Because yeah, yeah. that movie is so ahead of the times. You know what I recently found out, thanks to our listeners? Hmm. The boy's name in The Flight of the Navigator is David Scott. Oh, how funny. Oh, I funny. Never, I never knew that. He's got a last name, but David is his first name. Scott is his middle name. Mine, David, my middle name, Scott. Wow. Wow. No, I mean, that, that movie, um, that, that movie, and there, there's actually another one that I put on a similar level um, called Explorers that actually starred um, Ethan Hawke as a child, as well as, um, um, uh, oh man, I can't remember the kid's name now, but anyway, it has some major stars in it as kids and they, 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 they learn how to make a bubble uh, from, from dreams, from aliens. And they put a, they build a funny looking ship and they put it in a bubble and they actually fly away to an alien planet and they meet some aliens. And it's actually an amazing film. And uh, it, it's very different in the same way that Flight of the Navigator is different. But Flight of the Navigator was a much, um, much shinier, much, um, I think, much more realistic. It, it's amazing how, and that movie is so well done. I actually, my, my four year old daughter sat through that whole movie glued to the screen, just like, yeah, you know, just, I mean, it's good. You know, you know what I like about it is, you know, when when that movie came out in 1986, okay, yes, E.T. had come out. Yes, Close Encounters of the Third Kind had come out. And maybe a couple other movies that really didn't have the same type of impact as E.T. and Close Encounters. But this movie was so far ahead in the research times. Nobody, no ufologist back then was studying consciousness. Okay, today we hear about people who claim to fly craft with their minds. What happened in that movie? Young David steered that, you know, compliance, you know, with with the UF, the alien in there, which was a robot, with his mind. And wherever his oh, mind yeah. wanted to go, that's where they went. You and take, you take so many aspects of that movie. You take the way the shape the the ship reformed itself, the the material the ship was made out of, the artificial intelligence inside, the mission of the ship, the the brain control of the ship, the time lapse and time differential aspects of the script, the danger that might create to certain higher life forms versus not lower life forms, the rules the AI had to apply. I mean, there were so many aspects of that movie that were way beyond what anyone was talking about. And while I've never had a chance to research it, I am I am incredibly confident that there was someone involved in that movie that was doing I, some real research. I don't know if it was real research or they were tipped off because Disney's big enough to have that kind of pull. You it know? wasn't made by Disney. Well, they... Didn't they pick it up? They did. Actually, I just found this out today. Uh, they, they didn't. It wasn't actually made by Disney. It was made by a small little production company that had only done two other movies that were hits. And they ended up going out of business. And, and that's why Disney had so much trouble getting the rights to remake the, the, the movie because they had trouble getting the rights back. They were the distributor. They didn't actually make the film. Well, either way, I mean, the amazement of that from missing time. Oh, yes. To, to alien kidnappings to... Everything. I mean, the way the, the ship can change form from a teardrop to, to a saucer type of craft. I mean, everything that that movie is talking about now is the research that somebody like Grant Cameron is doing today. Dead on. And it's, I, I, it's dead on. And, and if, if you think about it, like in many ways, what is that ship? It's a von Neumann probe. <laughs> Right. In, in many ways. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, so many people are talking about this idea of sending AI probes to different places. That's exactly what that thing was. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a probe. It was a very fancy, very, very funny yeah. with a great sense of humor probe. And they're remaking this movie. Yeah. And they're remaking it. And it's, um, and one thing that's not clear is, are they, is, is it, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's just going to be a movie. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a mini series or, 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 or several episodes. Um, but the really interesting thing about it is the woman who's directing it 
um, has just come off of directing an episode of the new Boba Fett series. She directed one or two episodes of The Mandalorian, and she's also the daughter of um, yeah of um, of uh, uh, Ron Howard. No kidding. Yeah, no, and and she's acted in several films. You've seen her. She played. Uh, she was in Spider Man. She was in a bunch of things. But now she's focusing on directing, and she comes from some very good directing roots. Yeah, so, Ron, Howard, obviously, you know, she has better hair than her father. Let's let's put it that way. She does. Oh, she's got beautiful, beautiful red hair. Yeah, beautiful. Got, yeah, no, Anthe Mowat type hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. But she's a she's a. a fantastic director i mean she has a an incredible eye for for cinematography and so i think between her skills her recent experience and and the clout she pulls i think this has a chance of being a, a really uh it's got a really good chance of being a great film all right well i'm gonna keep my eye open for this because i'm very intrigued to see where this goes i mean wow this movie, if you have not seen the original Flight of the Navigator and you're into ufology, you have to watch that movie. Oh, yes. You it have must. it is must. a must watch on my list. Like people talk about other movies uh, that are out there, you know. I think if you take away the CGI of everything and you go back to 1986 with this one, my top two UFO movies are Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And Flight of the Navigator. And Flight of the Navigator is a definite must see if you are into UFOs because. And, and they you, hold up well. They have yes. been amazed how well the Flight of the Navigator holds up. I mean, it, it, it still look it doesn't, it doesn't look cheap the way some other sci fi films do now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's hope that they can do it some justice because there's oh. a, lot, a lot of truth in that one. And one more thing, um, this one, they're swapping out the main character. This one will have a female lead. Well, either way, either no, way. No, no, no. I just think it's it's going to be, that puts a different slant on it, which will be fun. It will. It, it'll, it'll, it'll make it a little more unique and a little more different and different interpretation to a degree. But, you know, it, it, it shows they're putting a lot of energy and thought into this. So I'm excited. All right. Let's move on to another topic because Tom DeLonge's now making a movie. Yes, well, you remember th this is the this is the the uh, the intended um, fruit of the uh, TTSA uh, Entertainment Wing, right? Was to make movies, and um, this um, this movie is uh, Monsters in California. Originally had a twenty twenty one date, and now we're hearing more like twenty twenty two. The movie is done. Um, now it's a matter of distribution and so forth. Um, it's, um, the movie it's, it's, I mean, I have to admit, it's not the most original uh, plot line, but you know, um, I actually do like the stories that he's written, uh, the, the, the two books that, that he's helped AJ Harley write. Um, I think they're, they're interesting stories. So I'm, I'm hoping it'll be similar to that, but it's basically about a, um, you know, a, a teenager who, you know, uh, start investigating some happenings and start uncovering a, um, Oh my goodness! A uh, unknown government secret about UFOs. So um, it's, um, but it's, it's the way he phrased it. He said it's, it would be like if Spielberg back in the day had made an R-rated indie paranormal film. That's how Tom actually described it. But the other interesting thing was this is another interview done by Spin, and um, while the writer did say that that they talked about UFOs, um, this article had zero mentions. This is the first article I've read with Tom DeLonge in it in a long time that had, other than mentioning the movie, there was absolutely zero mention of UFOs throughout the entire article. It was a pure music article. Hmm. That surprised me. Yep. Do we know who's acting in it? Who Tom has got available? Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, uh, if you go to the IMDb page for the movie, you can see the entire cast. All their headshots are in there with their names and characters they play and everything. Because the movie's done. Now it's just a matter of getting it released. Yep. Is it going to go major box office or is it going straight to Netflix or Amazon? Um, I, I, my impression is that they're going for for big box office. So the, one of the things that the writer said is that is that if the if the buzz and the um, and the energy behind this film pays out, that um, his future films will not have any funding issues. Well, we're we're gonna see. We'll this see. Long gets into the movie game. It's a big game. It's a tough game. Let's wish him well. I've been Absolutely. pretty hard on him. Been pretty hard on him. 
Well, let's no, wish. I wish him all the best. Yep, yep, yep. He did make a funny comment about the fact that the movie industry is nothing like the music industry. <laughs> no kidding. Well, yeah, when you once right. on top of the music industry like he was, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people catering to what you want. Oh yeah, and, totally. And when you fall off that ladder, there's a lot of catering to those people you need to have. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, it, it'll be interesting. I wish him all the best. Yeah, me too. All right, let's move on to another topic here. And once again, Meta Materials in play, this time in Denmark for the Terahertz Technology Center. What does this mean and why does this matter? So this is this is an interesting one to me because this these are these are are are, are initially unrelated stories. Okay, uh, what you have is you have um, a, a university in Denmark um, opening up a new terahertz technology center. So it will be a, a center that is is dedicated to terahertz technology development. Um, things like, for example, um, the the ability to generate terahertz radiation terahertz frequencies. Um, we We've only been able to do it fairly recently, and they're very, very large devices. So shrinking them down is one of their goals. Um, looking for new ways to apply terahertz radiation to uh, communication, to medicine, to it's basically going to be it's 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 a it's a fostering of that. It's an advocacy of that technology. But where it applies to us, and where I think is interesting, is that if you look at that very famous sample that most of us have seen, the the one that's layered of, of bismuth and magnesium over and over and over again. Um, and, and just for those who don't know, um, it, the, it's a it's a wedge that has 26 layers, and basically it alternates magnesium and um, and bismuth. And the the bismuth is only one to four microns thick, and the magnesium is 100 to 200 microns thick. And so um, this is something that we would have trouble doing because it's hard to get them to bond; they tend to shear off of each other. And um, we've had this sample since 1940. And Hal Putoff, Dr. Hal Putoff, one of his hypotheses is that um, the reason why this device, this piece of metal is made this way is because it could be, uh, or he believes it likely is, a terahertz waveguide. Meaning that if you if you made uh, walls out of it, you could use it to actually channel terahertz frequencies, okay? Um, but this was hard to test because we didn't have anything that generated terahertz you know, radiation. And my personal hypothesis is that this is the reason why the crater happened was because the army does have the ability to create terahertz um, signals. And so, and I don't, you know, TDSA couldn't, uh, couldn't get that kind of equipment. So I believe that's one of the reasons why they did the crater. But what it shows is, is that there's sometimes you need science to progress in, in the outside world for completely different reasons to generate the kind of science we need to then come back into our world and really figure out what's going on and how this stuff works and why it works that way. And so it just shows that there is a relationship between the progress of science, that sometimes the lack of progress in science is actually what's slowing down our research because we don't have the tools available to us to figure out how these things work or why we have them. Are these the same pieces of metamaterial that we were calling arts parts? That I don't know. I, I I believe that at times it has been called that, and I, but I, I've never been able to find out if that was actually true or not, because the impression I had at one point was that, that put off um, got a hold of this sample through some other means, um, that it wasn't part of arts parts, but I, I completely could be wrong. I, I don't know that for sure. I do know that this was recovered from, uh, from the 1940s. Okay, so uh, do we know what crash site then? Was it, no. is it Roswell? Is it something else? It's not been, it's not been released where the crash site was from. Cause the picture they use is mm-hmm. that triangular shape. Correct. That yep. It's pretty. And yeah, I believe, it's pretty. and I believe that's the one they got from Linda Moulton Howe. It's, it's, it's possible. It is. I could be wrong. I, I could be completely wrong. It, it's totally possible. It's totally possible. Um, I just, for some reason, the arts, the pictures I've seen of arts parts before, I, I don't, I didn't remember one of them being that pretty. And I've always thought the, 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 the sample that Hal shows is like, Hal put up shows is like, it's beautiful. I think it's really pretty. So I, I may be just misidentifying it, but it, it's definitely one of the older parts that have been, been floating around other people. I mean, this same sample, um, uh, Jeremy Corbell did a bunch of testing on it multiple years ago. Several people have had it and done testing on it over the years. Right. All right, John, thank you so much for a wonderful UAP report once again. And we'll talk to you in a couple days' time. Let's get to the news. Shirky Poo is waiting. (laughs) Thanks, sir.